All right, we continue our opponent previews with Arizona State, and I'm pleased to be joined by Chris Cartman of SunDevilSource.com, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. And Chris, thanks for joining me. Yeah, Brian, anytime. My pleasure. So you've been uh, covering the Sun Devils for a while, and uh, you know, like me, you've gone through some ups and downs uh, on your beat, and uh, you know, some unique things happening in both of our, our worlds the last several years. But uh, we're going to focus on ASU with this one. And um, you know, first off, what's this offseason been like for you? I get asked that a lot covering uh, Coach Prime and and the Buffs. But what's it been like uh, for you covering Coach Dillingham and that transition? Yeah, I feel like there's some similarities between what Colorado and ASU have gone through in terms of mostly the, the roster uh, remake, which is kind of unlike anything else probably in the country in terms of the amount of turnover. Uh, the NCAA suspending that rule that limited uh, teams to 25 new scholarships in a year uh, has been probably more beneficial to what Colorado and ASU have been trying to do with their rosters than any other teams in the country. And I don't know that um, these jobs wouldn't have been uh, three, four year rebuilds if not for that being the case. And so just sort of wrapping my hands around what they've tried to accomplish, how they've gone about it, what their roster looks like now. Those have been the main things I I've known Dillingham for a long time. He was a GA at ASU going back a decade or so. Uh, in his early to mid 20s and I know some of the other coaches on the staff so for me it was very easy to make the transition because I had relationships with some of these people which worked out quite well um, but it's just been a uh, non-stop sort of grind until pretty recently you know June is start things start to slow down and July will be a good month but um for ASU fans, it's been very exciting because they were going through a, a pretty down period of time, right? You're coming off the pandemic. You're looking for things that you can grab that are going to be positive, that give you enjoyment. And then you got an NCAA investigation and the program basically bottoming out. And that's, I think, the only reason that Dillingham ended up being the head coach as the youngest in the country and having no head coaching experience is very different than the model that had been sort of uh, long held by Michael Crow, the president and Ray Anderson, the athletic director. Yeah. You go from, uh, you know, that NFL type model with Herm Edwards and, you know, he was such an experienced coach to the complete opposite. <laughs> you know, you go to a guy that, you know, he's, he's the hometown guy, right. And youngest head coach. And um, how do you feel like he's handled the transition so far? Well, um, he has so much more knowledge in how things actually work in college football and recruiting than Herm Edwards had when he arrived. Yeah. And there, there was all those questions about, um, you know, the pro model and how that would work with, with, with Edwards. And he did bring in Antonio Pierce and they had, you know, there was a lot of sort of things that kind of worked for them for a period of time before it all unraveled. Uh, but, but when I talked to Dillingham, um, he has a very keen sense for a lot of the detail orientation elements that are so important to college football. Like he gets the portal. He connects well with young, young people. He understands how the recruiting game works in terms of the handlers, the mentors, the parents, regionality, the importance of all these sort of things, high school coaches. And, um, and so I think that all of those areas uh, especially when you have that local course knowledge that you have of being a graduate out of school and growing up in a city, you don't have a learning curve. And when that's the case, coupled with what I was saying earlier about how they added 30 new Division One transfers and 50 overall players, that that expedites the process. And and then they're they're you know they're um, we'll probably talk about this, but they have uh, an eight game home schedule. And it's very sort of user friendly for them kind of getting into a decent sort of a start that they can then ramp up from there. Yeah. It certainly sets up for, uh, I'm not going to say a dramatic turnaround, but it eases, like you said, uh, that turnaround, right. It can happen. Um, and it also helps, you know, quarterback is a huge deal. And now uh, you go get, uh, you know, Drew Pine, who was eight and two as a starter at Notre Dame last year and did pretty well, a four-star guy. And, uh, you know, Jaden Rashada is in here. And then, you know, Buff fans probably remember Trenton Borgay and what he did in Boulder 
you know, he did a pretty good job in his starts last year. I mean, he shredded the buffs last year. Everybody did. I know that, but you know, Trenton was a, a good quarterback. And so, you know, you've got three guys there that, you know, at least three guys that can play that position. Where, where is that position sitting right now? Do you, is Drew going to be the guy? So I think it's very much an open competition and it, it was, it was quite competitive in the spring. Um, I think a lot of people may not know that Borgay played last season on a, a foot that was still pretty much broken. He had a fifth metatarsal injury. He had a pin inserted into it. Um, some months earlier, that thing came loose, and he was bothered by it the whole year. Uh, nevertheless, he completed 70% of his passes. The, the only other quarterback to do that that got a lot of action in the Pac-12 was Bo Nix at Oregon. Of course, that was Dilling, Dillingham uh, coaching Nix, right? So, um, And then they went through the the – a transition to uh, Sean Aguano calling the plays and all that stuff. And they had a lot more success in the last five games of the season after that. So my view of it is that Borgay is very much an operator who has the ability to get the ball to playmakers in space. He doesn't have the big upside. He doesn't have like a big arm. There's questions about his ability to pump the ball down the field successfully. And the ASU has really great wide receivers and tight ends this year. Um, so are they going to be able to, with Borgay to beat the better teams on their schedule by uh, keeping defenses honest and backing them up a little bit. I think that's a little, that's a question. Um, but if you just evaluate it in terms of, okay, who did better in the spring? I think Borgay did better, but I think he, it was a little bit easier for him because the style of offense is slightly more conducive to what he's been accustomed to than Pine. Pine is more of a top down progression reader that's not really the way that this offense is. So I think that he's had to make more of an adjustment and also didn't have the familiarity with personnel like Elijah Badger and Jalen Conyers and other guys. So I, I feel like we're still going to be talking about this uh, probably three weeks into August and maybe even beyond that. And um, I, Pine has a little bit better physical tools probably, but not so much better that it may be able to, or that it will for sure, overcome the operational success that Borgay is is able to demonstrate. And so, I think if Borgay's arm gets a little arm talent gets a little bit better, he's bigger, he's stronger. Being back in the weight room and doing all those things after having foot problems for two years, that maybe helps his cause. And then Pine is going to have to basically show that he can operate at a very high level, uh, such that it unlocks confidence in the coaches that his maybe a little higher upside is worth kind of going with. And the good news for ASU is I, I feel like it's a very user-friendly system for quarterbacks. They've done a great job with not having elite talent uh, in the, wherever Dillingham's been. It's still getting a lot out of the quarterback position. And either way, they're going to end up with at least, I would say, mid-level quarterback play in the Pac-12. Yeah, and you know, like you said, options, right? And so you have guys that have been starters, and then Jaden Rashada comes in as a four-star recruit. Um, and you mentioned the weapons. I mean, I like Elijah Badger at receiver. Jalen Conyers uh, had a huge game against the Buffs last year. And then, uh, you know, Cameron Scadabo comes in. He was the Big Sky Offensive Player of the Year last year at, at Sac State. Uh, I know the question, it seems like it's the offensive line, right? It's kind of rebuilt there and uh, maybe not a lot of Power 5 experience. Is that right? Yes, I would say uh, similar to Colorado, right? Uh, yeah. Offensive line is the biggest question mark with this team. If they can keep the quarterback upright and also be able to establish a run game against decent opponents, they're going to be in really good shape. And if they yeah. don't, then they're probably going to have a harder time getting to the higher end of their range of, of potential. So, you know, that said, though, I think, that they have a pretty solid four to five guys up front. Um, you, you're going to return Isaiah Glass at left tackle. He's a starter. Joey Ramos was your right guard last year before he got an ankle injury that knocked him out for the season. Um, so those guys are, are solidified. They got in uh, Leif Fautanu, uh from UNLV, a three-year starter at center, who I don't think is going to be a drop-off from Ben Scott, who was a uh, first-year center last year before he transferred to Nebraska. Aaron Frost was one of the better offensive tackles in the Mountain West at Nevada and considering an NFL early entry before he tore an ACL uh, that he's now more than a year removed from. So he has a chance to be a right tackle. They went out and they got a couple guys after the spring to service the left guard spot. 
uh, because Ben Coleman had a lower leg injury that's probably going to keep him out most of the season as a transfer from Cal. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are definitely not in a, what I would say, a, a good situation at, at offensive line, but it could be serviceable if some of these pieces kind of come together. And as you said there, um, their skill positions are actually quite good. You know, Scadabo look, look like one of their better offensive players in the spring. So did actually uh, the wide receiver that they got from Idaho State, Xavier Guillory. He looked almost like he was like similar in terms of his potential to Badger, which is kind of remarkable to say because obviously Badger had 70 catches last year and is one of the best uh, receivers coming back in the conference. And they also got Melquan Stovall from, from Colorado State as a receiver, who's a slot guy who can pair with Geo Sanders, who had 40 catches last year. Um, and you said Conyers, of course. I mean, he had 30 catches in the last five games, three touchdowns against Colorado, 10 catches against Arizona. It looked like probably the best player on the team in the spring. So they have very potent weapons. They got to have to be able to block and protect for sure. Yeah. Uh, so on the flip side, can they stop anybody? You know, uh, Brian Ward comes in. Um, his defense at Washington State was pretty good last year, uh, but obviously, you know, whole new pieces to work with here. Uh, can they stop people? Yeah, I think um, that what happened last year at Washington State is very encouraging because that was his first year as a coordinator. Mm-hmm. It's not like he inherited a bunch of four or five star talent. They don't have any of that at Washington State. Um, and he got the most out of probably average personnel. They were top three in several categories. Hard, they played hard, physical, smart, assignment sound football. And I think that that's probably going to translate, especially because They've added six or seven transfers from the portal who are probably going to start, who are experienced guys. They've come in already kind of understanding schemes and what they have to do to be successful, and that's been demonstrated on film. It's not like you're having to quickly develop a bunch of guys to understand how to play football at the Division I level. They're getting, like, good players. You know, either they were FCS all-conference players or they were – they were you know, backups at Oklahoma and Texas and places like that who have looked really good. Um, in the case of Clayton Smith as a defensive end, Prince Dorba, a defensive end, Travion Brown was a linebacker at Washington State who was like their first backup linebacker, played a ton. Um, and then the guy they've added in the secondary. So I think they're going to be gra- much more aggressive than last year. They were the most conservative defense, almost never blitzed. Um they're going to be able to cover on the back end, which is going to give them opportunities to get takeaways, three and outs, negative plays. They're going to give up points and yards against some of the better teams for sure. They're going to probably end up in higher scoring games sometimes as a result of that. They're going to need their offense to be very productive to win those games. But I don't expect them to be anything less than like an average Pac-12 defense. Yeah, it's interesting that they were the most conservative because for years Arizona State was like, the, one of the most aggressive offense or defenses that I mean they were constantly Tiger, yeah, yeah I mean they were constantly in the backfield and, and blitzing so it's interesting to see ASU go to that other extreme but um so as you look at everything you know Kenny Dillingham first year you know all the things that have happened at ASU what's a good year for the Sun Devils this year I really think that anything less than a 500 record is underachieving what their talent and their schedule dictate should happen um my prediction is probably somewhere around seven wins, actually, which is probably going to surprise people because they're 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 you know you look at the the the, the prediction betting models and stuff, and it's like they're they they should be a four or five win team. I'm actually not somebody who tends to be very bullish relative to the national expectations on ASU. I've predicted one ten win season in like the last fifteen years, and they've had three, I think. So, um, but this. You know, and people will underestimate how quickly that a team can be remade in this particular year, given some of the rule changes and how much the portal is now impacting things. And when you have an eight game home schedule, uh, there's I don't think there's any way the ASU is not going to win at least half of those games, if not more. And then they're going to win a couple of games on the road. Like, so. Um, you know, probably they're going to win somewhere between six and eight games. And, it, you know, we'll see in camp kind of how they have, uh, you know, injuries or other things that maybe are setbacks that you go, okay, that's going to that's gonna hurt them. Um, we'll see. But um, 
you know, the, the, the last two times that ASU had an eight game home schedule, 2007 was Dennis Erickson's first year. They won 10 games. Yeah. And then Todd Graham won 10 games early in his tenure with an eight game home schedule. So this team probably not as good as that Graham team for sure, but talent wise, probably not far off from the 2007 Erickson team. And a lot of times when you get, the uh, culture change where everybody's feeling good about what you're doing and they're bought in and they're working hard in that first year. If you can get some early success that then sort of springboards you through a schedule, I think. So um, I would be, I, I would consider it very much an underachievement if this team isn't bowl eligible this year, based upon everything that I'm, I've seen. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, this game, well, I mean, these two teams outside of this game are going to be interesting case studies uh, around the country to see you know uh, how quickly can you turn over a team because nobody's done it more so than these two i mean texas state's got a ton of uh, transfers as well but at the power five level i mean it's colorado and asu i mean and usc had a big turnover last year but it was more the quality than the quantity whereas asu and cu are so much quantity of, of turnover that it's gonna be an interesting year to watch both of these programs yeah i mean as you know brian like covering a team a long time, you never would see more than 30 ish new guys on a roster, right? Yeah. Like, like that didn't happen in spring ball. You never saw more than like 10 to 12 or something new guys, like 15 at the very most or something like that. Right. Yeah. I'm looking around ASU's team this spring and it was not an exaggeration. It was 20 new players who were good. Like, yeah. like guys that are going to either start or be their top backups at position. And that is so different. It's just so, uh, you know, unprecedented, really, that when that's the case at a Colorado or an ASU, and we've, you know, and they were you know, bad teams last year, right? Yeah. People are going to, people are not going to really understand the ability to turn things around. Doesn't mean they're going to do it, but the potential is absolutely there to uh, significantly overachieve expectations. Yeah, and then for us, the weird thing is, too, is 40 some guys you watch in the spring game are no longer there, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, oh, it, yeah, you strange. have to learn the yeah. whole, you have to learn the whole, it's all new. Like, you have to learn everything and figure out all this stuff and all these players. Like, ASU, I don't know, Colorado probably has, you know, around the same or maybe less. ASU has, I think, 31 returning scholarship players from last year. And out of the 31, it's like 15 to 20 are like, in the two deep, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you have, you know, more than half of your important players are new players weren't on the roster. And um, that's maybe hard for fans because they, they want that whole, okay, I can visualize what's going to happen with this roster a year, two years, three years from now. I like the direction of this program, all this stuff. And right now they're just having to take the word of somebody like you or me about yeah. just kind of like where they're actually at plus have to learn all of these new things that are very difficult and challenging, but I don't think that's really going to be changing. We're now in a new era where you're just going to get a ton of FCS and, and group of five players consistently moving up after proving themselves at a lower level. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to see, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, down in Tempe. Um, is it September, October? I can't remember even when it is. I think it's like right around the end of September, beginning of October. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll see you down there somewhere. I know it'll be hot. It'll still be in the 90s. I think. <laughs> yeah, if we're, if, if we're lucky. <laughs> right. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. All right, Brian. Thank you.